Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 21st, 2017, and my guest is Rob Reich, professor of political science and by courtesy professor of philosophy and at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. He's the director of the Center for Ethics in Society and co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. He has written a number of provocative articles on the role of foundations and philanthropy, which will be our topic for today and which we will link to. Rob, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks. Really glad to be here. I want to start with the history of foundations that you touch on briefly in one of your papers. I was surprised at some of the things I learned from that. Talk about how Rockefeller uh, started and some of the issues that came up with Congress and the decision about federal versus state uh, establishing of a foundation. Sure. Well, begin with a a kind of ordinary observation, which is that uh, philanthropic activity or behavior is time immemorial. People have been volunteering or giving away money or doing something altruistic and other oriented um, since the um, recorded history that we have. But the creation of a legal entity known as a a foundation, uh, a private foundation that directs private resources for some public purpose, is a relatively new phenomenon. And so the history of foundations in the United States, which really uh, pioneered the form of a private foundation, is, I think, uh, a lost history, un- unappreciated uh, by uh, uh, you know, contemporary uh, voices today. So uh, John D. Rockefeller, one of the uh, wealthiest people of the first uh, Gilded Age in the United States uh, 100 plus years ago, had amassed a, a mountain of wealth and uh, so large that he decided, as uh, did some of his contemporaries like Andrew Carnegie, uh, to devote a considerable portion of those uh, resources for some public benefit um, to become a philanthropist. And um, the way to create some type of charitable trust or a, an entity that had some capacity to direct uh, money for some public purpose was to go off to a a state legislature and ask to be incorporated. Um, At that point in time, uh, we were just beginning to see general incorporation laws passed in various states, which allowed either for-profit or non-profit entities to to incorporate. At that point in time, in the early 1900s, even the distinction between a for-profit and a non-profit was not a um, universal or um, uh, federally recognized distinction. So any incorporated entity needed to seek legislate, uh, legislative approval. And the typical way that um, any entity for philanthropic purposes would do that would be to go off to a state legislature. And uh, Rockefeller was in New York, so one consideration was to, was to trot off to the New York legislature. But because he had so much money and because his preferred philanthropic mission was the very general purpose of trying to improve the prospects of humankind... Uh, He was worried that the New York State Legislature wouldn't look favorably upon incorporation because the New York State Legislature was accustomed to approving philanthropic entities primarily for the benefit of citizens of New York State. So uh, the attempt was to go off to Congress uh, in D.C. and ask for a federal uh, charter to create um, the Rockefeller Foundation, which would operate with this very general mission. And uh, partly because Rockefeller himself was um, not universally popular, he, he was viewed in many respects as uh, um, having earned a good portion of his wealth through some um, nefarious means. And then partly there were concerns just about the size of the uh, philanthropic entity he was hoping to create. And he encountered enormous resistance in Congress. So the sitting president suggested that the that Congress should should turn down the request to create a, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. Samuel Gompers, at that point the head of the uh, AFL, uh, said that uh, the only thing that Rockefeller could do in a philanthropic entity would be to create to create a, a foundation which would, in the course of time, teach people 
um, how, how to prevent themselves from becoming like Mr. Rockefeller. And then from my point of view, most interestingly, various people testified before Congress saying that even if um, Rockefeller had earned the money in a, in a completely legitimate way, and even if you were to ascribe to Rockefeller the most uh, beneficent and um, uh, magnanimous intentions, that nevertheless, the creation of a large foundation was inimical to or uh, repugnant to the purposes of a democratic society. And um, in fact, Rockefeller uh, had to create various types of accommodations in Congress to seek approval. He offered to have a board of governance that would include various elected officials as well as the presidents of several Ivy League colleges. He offered to cap the um, foundation at a certain amount of money, $50 million, if I remember correctly. And he even offered to insist upon a spend down requirement that the Rockefeller Foundation would have to um, you know, basically spend out within um, 50 years. Uh, and despite having made various accommodations that would have created a quasi public governance model and a non perpetual model uh, for a private foundation, Nevertheless, the Congress still uh, refused to approve the foundation. So after several years of trying, he uh, went back to New York State and, and got New York State to approve the foundation and set up shop from there and more or less did what he want, wanted um, despite the, um, the state level uh, incorporation. I just want to clarify one thing. You mentioned Samuel Gompers of the AFL. That's the American Federation of Labor, which is yeah. part later merged – and became the AFL-CIO for people who might be more familiar with that. So here's the thing I didn't understand. It's a legal question, I guess. Now, why did he need a foundation? Why couldn't he just give away money, right? He could just write a check, which I'm sure he did in his lifetime. He sees a charity that he likes. He writes a check. Um, I guess there's a challenge after he dies, the check-writing activity. What, why do you need an organiz, organized thing called a foundation with a legal structure. Do you have an, do you know? Yeah, a, a couple of reasons. Um, uh, I can't speak definitively to Rockefeller's specific intentions here, but more, more generally to the, the views of various philanthropists of that day. And I think still in certain respects still today about why the foundation structure itself is important. Um, so the, the first is that uh, there was an aspiration um, started by Carnegie and Rockefeller, that the, um, the particular purpose of a foundation, as opposed to um, simply writing checks in a, in a you know, charitable donor form, was that uh, charitable giving or check writing uh, was for the direct relief of disadvantage or poverty or the provision of social services of various kinds, whereas philanthropic or foundation activity sought to get at the root causes of those problems. And so it were, foundations were imagined as an attempt to try to uh, undertake scientific or social scientific uh, um, solutions to the root causes of various social ills. And that was considered to require a, a professional staff. So, uh, you know, whereas any ordinary charitable donor could, of course, hire at his or her own expense uh, professional staff to help understand how best to give money away, creating the foundation form um, helped to make that into not the effort of a private individual hiring people at private expense to direct um, philanthropic assets, but rather to create a philanthropic entity itself with the benefit of it, uh, it being tax exempt and signaling to the world a philanthropic intention uh, rather than having, as it were, a family office, which wealthy people um, had then and still have today, uh, uh, to do that work. The foundation was a, a partially public-facing entity, unlike just the you know, charitable checkbook or the family office of an especially wealthy person. So today, the tax deductibility of, of a foundation's activity is very important. Okay. And we're going to talk about that. But in Rockefeller's time, of course, there was, I think, um, when he established it, the Rockefeller Foundation, there was no federal income tax. Or am I, was it later than that? Yeah, you, you've got it right. The, the proposals to create the Rockefeller Foundation and the actual creation of the Carnegie Foundation of Advancement of Teaching and the Carnegie Corporation, um, well, that all happened prior to the introduction of the federal income tax. 
um, which came uh, came online, and I think if I recall correctly, 1916, 1917. Um, so uh, you're right. The 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 tax exempt um, exemption for the direction of, of private wealth into a foundation didn't have any special tax advantages at the time. But couldn't at the time couldn't they have just incorporated as a I don't know what the choices were then, but you'd think they could just have incorporated as a company that yeah. that just happened to have these missions that you talked about. The the idea that they would go to Congress for special permission or the New York State Legislature is just it just seems weird. I, I'm I don't I don't mean to suggest there's something incredibly fascinating about, it, but it's somewhat interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe I should have mentioned earlier uh, one additional reason you alluded to this to your you alluded to this yourself. Uh, um, many people sought through philanthropic means to create entities which would last beyond their death, and the creation of a corporation, um, an ordinary corporate form, would not have allowed donor intent to have been protected in perpetuity. Whereas the the um, the the creation of a charitable trust, but now converted into a pro- the form of a private foundation, did allow um, the legal obligation to honor donor intent even beyond the death of the donor. And in fact, the default form, the default legal arrangement for a foundation is indeed perpetuity. Um, you know, so in the usual skeptical phrase, the dead hand of the donor reaches out from the grave to strangle future generations. <laughs> uh, so. Um What's the right word? Uh, generous on the part of the describer. Uh, yeah. it, it, so donor intent is an interesting thing. Well, let's digress on that for a minute because yeah. uh, it's hard to describe uh, intent, and there's a lot of slippage twixt the cup and the lip uh, for a donor and the foundation that the donor creates. A lot of people have remarked on the fact that the Ford Foundation and other foundations probably would not make their donors so happy. Maybe they didn't describe their intent sufficiently uh, precisely. The Ford Foundation is a special case because the um, Ford family formally renounced and removed themselves from the board of governance of the Ford Foundation for a variety of reasons, um, and, but was otherwise entitled to a certain governance role. Uh, and as Darren Walker, the current president of the Ford Foundation, says – um, if uh, the Ford family had known that 50 years after the creation or whatever it is of the Ford Foundation that a gay black man would be the head of the Ford Foundation, they would certainly be turning over in their <laughs> grave today. So, I mean, this is one of the challenges of, of donor intent, of course, which is that mores, norms, attitudes change. Yeah. Uh, Rhodes, the one I was thinking of was the Rhodes Scholarship, which was designed for young men. At some point in the last 25 years, I don't know when, maybe you know, they decided to open it to women, even though – it's very explicitly said says in the charter that it's it's for men only. There's no – this isn't a, a question of I wonder what the donor would have wanted. It, it's written down and yet either because – I don't know who would adjudicate such an issue. The heirs – could the heirs sue to yeah. have the, the, the ancestors' intent changed? Could the heirs sue if they didn't like it, that it had changed, that the directors were doing something different? Do you know the answers to those questions? Yeah, I think any any of the above. So um, um, if the current board of trustees of an entity wishes to um, change the donor intent, um, the board of trustees could, as it were, um, sue the heirs of the initial donor in order to redirect the, the mission. My, my, you know, I'm no legal scholar, but my loose understanding here is that such um, attempts are rarely successful except in cases where, because of changing social conditions and indeed laws, whatever the initial donor intent had been is now um, either illegal or perhaps socially frowned upon, as in the case of the, the, the Rhodes Scholarships. Um, um, in other cases, uh, various outside entities, say the beneficiaries of the philanthropic entity, might sue the um, foundation or the trust to have the purpose changed somewhat. And then in that case, the board of trustees could, in effect, um, defend the donor intent, um, honoring the mission of the of the donor. So one thing that, that we know for sure is that uh, foundations have become a lot more common in the last right. couple of decades and a lot bigger. So talk about some of the numbers there. Yeah. Um, so the 
number of foundations has gone up dramatically over the course of the past generation. And, you know, here I just think it's a, the, a consequence of the rise of inequality uh, in the United States. And we we're living in what you could call the second gilded age. And the number of people with uh, extraordinary wealth has gone up dramatically. And for you know familiar economic uh, reasoning, the marginal utility of an additional dollar when you're a billionaire is um, pretty small for personal consumption. And uh, people are inclined to direct a uh, considerable amount of money for philanthropic purposes. So um, you know, my recollection of the most recent numbers is that uh, if you went back in time about 20 years ago, we had something on the order of between 20 and 30,000 um, private foundations in the United States. And now it's um, more than double. And the number of new foundations on the scene, um, like, for example, the Gates Foundation, but not only, you know, new tech wealth has brought in a large number of, of donors um, who are giving at earlier stages in their careers, um, at, at younger ages, and often um, trying to direct the, um, uh, the, the wealth in more specific, specific ways. So the um, tech wealth has created, a, um, especially out here in the Bay Area, a large number of new foundations with um, active and engaged donors at the helm of that money, um, seeking to create various forms of uh, public, public uh, benefit or, or social policy change. So you say in 1930, there were about 200 private foundations and their assets – we're less than a billion dollars. Of course, there's been a lot of inflation, but it's now over 100,000 foundations this is as of 2013, and they're worth more than 800 billion. I just yeah. want to – pet peeve of mine is a, a precise use of the word inequality. So you, you mentioned inequality, but it's, it's really just that the richer people are richer than they were before. That doesn't necessarily mean there's more inequality. There is probably. Uh, but it could have been we all got a lot richer, but it didn't turn out probably to be the case. Um, but it's true that that the most successful people are more successful than the most successful people generations ago. And therefore, there's a lot of extra money that they are willing to give away, which is one would think would be a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you uh, raised the possibility it's a bad thing, which I thought was really interesting, which is uh, why I wanted to do this interview. So what's what sounds great? All these just generosity, uh, as you write in the um, your article in the Boston Review, you say, shouldn't we be grateful to the person who devotes his private wealth to public purposes rather than consuming conspicuously or passing his wealth to children and relatives? And so, uh, what's wrong with that? Right. Uh, uh, certainly, the I think the natural attitude today is that uh, what citizens or ordinary folks owe uh, big philanthropists is uh, simple gratitude, because even if the money were somehow to be wasted philanthropically, what the philanthropist always can say in her defense is that surely it's better to have tried to have done something philanthropic than to have simply engaged in more private consumption. especially. Yacht. When you're a billionaire. And, um, yeah, I get, you know, so I, I have a, a couple of responses. I mean, in certain respects, the uh, overarching ambition of uh, the stuff I've been writing is to try to sweep away that very attitude. I, I, I don't believe that what private um, philanthropists or, or excuse me, what philanthropists are owed is nothing but gratitude. And so I'll tick off a couple a couple thoughts about that. So the first is that especially when we're talking about big philanthropy, people with extraordinary wealth who attempt to convert private assets into some public influence, um, philanthropy constitutes an exercise of power. And in a democratic society, power deserves scrutiny, not simple gratitude. Now, notice I haven't said that that power is illegitimate to wield or that that power can be used for good purposes. Uh, I think it can be used for good purposes, but the, the relevant question is to pay attention to the power and to um, direct some um, uh, um, uh, questions and various types of scrutiny rather than simply congratulate its exercise or be grateful for its exercise. Beyond that, uh, I think that private foundations in particular are rather idiosyncratic, um, very peculiar uh, organizational forms or uh, corporate bodies because they're marked by an almost complete lack of accountability. So just because it's the most familiar thing to refer to these days, the largest foundation in the world is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, 
foundations, unlike their corporate um, peers within the ordinary marketplace of for-profit firms, foundations have no marketplace competitors. There's no rival foundation attempting to put the Gates Foundation out of business. To the contrary, um, um, there's no competitive dynamic from rival firms or, for that matter, from consumers who could fail to purchase the products that a for-profit firm has on offer. Um, in the case of foundations, there's no consumer. There's supplicants, people who are um, clamoring for the attention of the, the donor rather than potentially um, um, seeking to hold it accountable in the ordinary marketplace ways by, by not purchasing something. And then the uh, alternative here to the marketplace would be various public agencies uh, or government. And uh, government, which spends a bunch of money uh, in various ways, has familiar systems of democratic accountability through the ballot box. So that if any of us as citizens, um, you know, we don't like what the uh, the local school board is doing with uh, public funds for education or this, or this, you know, our state legislature in terms of its allocations for education. We can elect some new people at the, the next electoral cycle and try to put people in place who have our preferred preferences. Um, but you can't do that with the foundation. So, um, you know, as, as the critic Diane Ravitch says of the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates serves as the nation's unelected school superintendent. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I had I had Diane as Diane on as a guest a while back, and it's a great line. Yeah, uh, it, it's a, it's a little bit misleading, and I want to I want to just respond to your point about accountability, which is it's clearly true. Uh, and we recently had it was, it's clearly true that there's less there's not much accountability at a foundation if you don't like it. Um, right. You can refuse to accept gifts from them. Uh, it's, you could argue that that's a sufficiently high level of accountability since. They have no power to take money away from me. They only have the power to give it away, which is somewhat different, I would say, from a competitive enterprise in a free market system, which has the accountability of consumer choice and and uh, you know the freedom not to buy the product. So it's a little bit different. And then in the case of the school superintendent, of course, an actual school superintendent – doesn't have that much accountability, unfortunately. My vote at the ballot box is an incredibly weak read to lean on. Um, we did have Chris Blattman on recently complaining about to Bill about some of the initiatives of the Gates Foundation. He wrote an open letter, which disappeared into the ether, and we joked about that. So, so right. the ability of people to influence the Gates Foundation is – there is some ability, but it's, it's very limited. And it's more limited, uh, I would accept, than the ballot box, but it is different because – that school superintendent forces me through my taxes to pay for the education of, of the children around me, even if I don't agree with it. Whereas uh, Bill, Bill only exploits me in another way, which you which you wisely point out, which is he forces me to uh, he can force me to subsidize his foundation through tax uh, tax legal tax. Yeah. The way the tax system is set up through a tax subsidy. So respond to me if you'd like to that little rant and then um, talk about the tax, why the tax issue makes it sure. a little, well, little more relevant. Tax, let's get to the taxes thing in a minute. Let's just go with the yeah, the completely appropriate observation you make, an important observation that perhaps a, a sufficient form of accountability for foundations is that uh, the actual transfer of philanthropic assets from a foundation to a grantee is a, an ordinary contract. And um, the moment of contract, the recipient is uh, voluntary and can refuse to, to, to accept the donation. Um, so uh, I grant that uh, entirely. I, I wouldn't say, however, that that's a sufficient form of accountability, in part because the um, let's call it a power imbalance that exists traditionally between especially large donors and the array of needy nonprofit recipients all clamoring for the attention of the donor. Um, in other words, uh, here, here's, I think, a roughly analogous situation. Imagine a case of a wealthy person now not interested in philanthropy, but interested in transferring money to his or her kids. And so the um, parent sets up a trust for the child, which unlocks over various life stages with some strings attached at each point and says to the kid, you know, here's what um, I'm going to make available for you. Um, uh, um, here's some money at the age of 18, the age of 25, the age of 35, whatever it turns out. 
And uh, sure, the kid could refuse that paternalism um, exercised over him or her by saying, I don't want any of your inheritance because that's a similar moment of contract. But um, the power that a parent wields over a child, especially, as you say, where the benefit is money that would be difficult to come by otherwise, is rather large. So it would be one, one nice thing would be to actually explore empirically um, how often does it happen that uh, a grant offered or extended uh, by a foundation is at the moment a potential contract refused by a recipient? Um, I don't have that data. I'm not sure anyone does, but m my guess is it happens with extraordinary infrequency. Well, um, of course, I, mean, I agree with that. I think the issue is what strings come with it, and uh, that would be true of the parent too. The parent, through so the prospect of um, making a, 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 a um, bequeathing some of one's state to a child, has influence over them long before the gift is made. That's true. Uh, a friend of mine, I. Uh, his father, he's a listener to Econ Talk, so uh, I don't know if he'll catch this, but he, his his father uh, allegedly kept a loose leaf notebook for his children's um, inheritance for the will. And if any of the children misbehaved, he would just shuffle some pages out of their section into one of their siblings. Now, I don't know if that was – I love that. I think that's hilarious, and I don't know if that's apocryphal or true, but um, – Perhaps he'll let me know. Maybe yeah. maybe he doesn't know if it's a Bach filter. Maybe it was just a, a threat you had right. to wonder about. Um, so it, it's true that that the prospect of money changes people's behavior, and you allude to it in your one of your articles. I I heard it firsthand from a a foundation officer who said after rising to the, his position, he was told, "Congratulations." You'll never get an honest compliment, and you'll never pay for dinner for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, I ruined that joke because it should be the other order. But um, exactly. Or but, I wanted to add that you know another kind of anthropological or sociological observation that people who previously were on the grantee side, so, you know, working for a nonprofit, then who cross the street and become uh, a program officer at a foundation is that overnight they become much more intelligent, yep. much wittier, and better looking in yeah. any room. Yeah, their, joke, um, their jokes get funnier. It's incredible. Yes. Um, must be something about the position, uh, uh, as we know it is. But, you know, it, it, it raises a very interesting uh, thought, which I hadn't had until I, we talked about it, which is, now I can't choose my – I can't go to a different parent. Right. Uh, but I can go to a different foundation – and it's an interesting thing that – and we're talking about strings earlier. Uh, if foundations put strings on their money and, and the recipients don't like those strings, they can go to other places. There is competition in that sense. So that's uh, some of the – that insulates the recipients from the, the coercive power of the foundation to some extent. But having said that, there's no doubt that the prospect of getting money uh, changes your behavior and, and gives power to the recipient, to the donor. I would also add, however, that I've seen some very wealthy people in my time, not very often, a, a couple – I've probably stood next to a couple billionaires in person. And uh, one that I'm thinking of was extremely uncomfortable being out in public because he must get asked constantly for money and because he's very, he's very generous and he's very philanthropic. And I just noticed how uneasy he was uh, and – it's interesting, right? It's just a, it's sort of the flip side of the power. You'd think having money gives you power, and of course it does, but it also comes at a price. Uh, I agree. Uh, no, the social awareness that people are philanthropists and have an extraordinary capacity to give money away creates a social dynamic of people who are supplicants for the most part, or just as you said before, um, you're always uncertain who's being honest with you and under what circumstances. All things considered, you know, I'd say I have only tiny violins to play for, yeah. uh, but um, um, I, I don't deny the observation. Yeah, no, um, I think I've read it before on the, on the air, but Franklin P. Adams wrote a very nice poem about this. Um, I think it's called The Rich Man, and I will not try to read it. Uh, live from memory, but it's worth uh, – we'll put a link up to it. At any rate, so there is some power, but it's only the power of of being a fount of money. And then the question then is the tax issue. 
So talk about how the tax issue comes into play and, and why for some people that uh, gives us some, uh, as a society, some ability to to regulate or at least have some say in the way foundations are run. Right. So um, if it were the case that philanthropy, and here I'm talking both big philanthropy and a private foundation, but also ordinary charitable giving of the sort that you or I do, making you know a $100 donation to our preferred nonprofit recipient, if it were the case that such giving were just the exercise of our liberty to dispose of our legitimately um, earned assets or money um, how we saw fit, then, um, you know, whatever your preferences, Russ, about the array of organizations you wanted to support, whatever my preferences were, we could just say we were um, uh, exercising our liberty to do with our wealth what we wish. But given that there are tax incentives attached to uh, the creation of a foundation or the donation of charitable dollars, um, the existence of tax expenditures for philanthropy makes it not quite the case that we're simply exercising our liberty. What I think it's more accurate to say that there is a tax incentive to stimulate the exercise of our liberty mm-hmm. and then our charitable donations or philanthropic gifts are partly public and partly private. Um, so let's just be concrete about this. The way the tax incentive works is the, it's a deduction, not a tax credit, means that the higher up the income scale you are, the greater the public subsidy attached to your charity. Um, so if you're in the 30% tax bracket, uh, if you make a $100 donation, um, it actually costs you $700 and $300, excuse me, it actually costs you um, uh, $70 and uh, $30 of your tax burden would be um, foregone, which is to say the IRS collects less money and whatever fraction of a benefit that each of us would receive as an individual from the spending of public dollars, uh, we receive less of it. So Every single one of us as citizens subsidizes the exercise of uh, um, philanthropists um, of all stripes, and that gives the public, it seems to me, an interest in what philanthropists do with their money. Um, uh, I haven't uh, said it's obvious exactly what that interest amounts to, but I think it is obvious that when people say, God damn it, it's my money and I'm going to do with it what I want, well, only if you're not taking any tax advantage for the um, philanthropic direction of that money, because when you get a 40 percent tax break or more in some cases, then uh, it's not quite accurate to say that it's just your money and you can do what you want with it. Yeah, I find that argument un- unconvincing uh, in one dimension. In, in, a, in some dimensions, it's, it's absolutely right. And, and, and you tell that great story about George Soros sure. saying um, – I want to do it's my money and do whatever I want with it. And a staffer says, go ahead, tell the story. Yeah. So in the final days of creating the Open Society Institute and the Associated Foundations, um, there was disagreement amongst the staff that Soros had hired about exactly what their program areas or areas of uh, focus would be. And uh, to resolve the disagreement, Soros allegedly slammed his fist on the table and said, well, at the end of the day, it's my money. We're going to do it my way in a program officer that he'd hired said, well, actually, Mr. Soros, about 30 percent or 40 percent of it would have been the taxpayer's money. So I think some other people actually have a say in what you do here, too. And uh, he was fired the next week. Yeah, Um, not surprising uh, because it was at least in some dimension his money in terms of who he hired and fired in the foundation. But I think it's it's a it's a fascinating uh, philosophical issue for me because it opens the door to the argument that that we, some measure of we, should have a say in that money. And my view is is that either make it tax deductible or you don't. If if you make it tax deductible, then it's it's a what restrictions you put on the foundation should stand or fall on their own merit, not just on the argument. Well, it's our money too. We get to have a say. I think the relevant question is. Is, are those restrictions good or bad? So, for example, let, and we'll talk about them in a minute, various ideas of transparency, various ideas about accountability, various ideas about timing, uh, whether it should be perpetual or not. Those are all interesting questions that I think are important and have impacts, but they aren't justified in and of themselves by the fact that, that 
the political process has decided that this should be uh, tax tax deductible. Now, you could argue that if you want to have no strings attached, and no one's going to argue this either, except maybe a few people. But you could argue if you want no strings attached, then don't take the deduction, as you point as you said. Um, and so. In the old days, there was no tax deduction because there was no income tax. And uh, I think even though I'm a big fan of civil society and private initiative and voluntary solutions from the bottom up rather than the top down, uh, I think, you know, there's a – I think there's a there's a lot to be said for not subsidizing foundations and not subsidizing charitable donations. I know that there's an argument to be made for it. I know what the argument is. It overcomes a free rider problem, and that's all true. But I think it's it that's not again that even that's not enough either. That doesn't prove that it's good to have tax deductibility. As you point out, it gives very wealthy people large uh, control over large amounts of money that are much larger than they otherwise would be. Uh, because of this tax policy, right? I mean, and I would say the kind of conventional argument on behalf on behalf of the tax um, incentives, in this case, the deduction, is that it will um, stimulate uh, more philanthropy than would be the yep. case without the deduction. Yep. And uh, well, that's not a question that's going to be resolved philosophically. That's an empirical question. And um, to the best of my knowledge, and I've checked into this. Uh, Economists who have studied this have a, um, a kind of mixed record uh, um, to report on whether or not the tax incentive actually kicks out more money than we've given otherwise. Um, th- so it's an open question whether or not that particular defense will will carry the day. Um, it, many people give money um, without even thinking about whether there's a tax benefit for it. And and you know just one small thing here. This is less about big donors than about small donors. Given the you know the, the complicated structure of the U.S. tax code, um, the ordinary person um, only itemizes uh, after a certain level of Correct. income, and it's only when you itemize your charitable um, giving that you can um, you know, take advantage of the deduction. Otherwise, you just take the standard deduction. So, uh, my best recollection is that you know as of a couple of years ago, something of something on the order of 70% of all um, tax filers just take the standard deduction. So there's no um, incentive in place for them just for charitable giving in the form of a tax deduction. And yet the overwhelming majority of Americans, something on the order of 90 plus percent of people make charitable donations every year. Yep. And, and you know, the, I think the argument, which you started to elaborate on, you mentioned it, but you didn't elaborate on much. The argument is that, well, some charity is good, more charity is better, and that right. just doesn't follow. Again, even that though I'm a big fan of civil society, if I don't like what Bill Gates is doing or Mark Zuckerberg, why do I want more of it? Why do I want a small group of people deciding where large sums of money go? Now, I happen, right. to, I happen to believe in the personal liberty side. I'd much rather see an elimination of the tax deductibility and let uh, people be free to spend where they want. But that's, that's a philosophical question. Let's put it to the yeah. side. Um, having said all that, you then talk about, I think, two very thoughtful and insightful arguments in favor of foundations. Uh, you call them pluralism and the discovery argument. Talk about right. each of those, please. Yeah, good. So, I mean, to put this provocatively, perhaps especially for um, uh, folks listening who are engaged in, in, in philanthropy themselves, um, uh, I front load an awful lot of the things uh, that I've written with deep skepticism that that big philanthropy can be made compatible with the expectations of democratic governance. Um, why is that? Well, for the kind of trivial reason that big philanthropy represents a plutocratic element uh, by definition. Um, um, it, you have to have large wealth in order to uh, uh, create such an entity of a, like a, a large private foundation. And when you're converting your private assets into some sort of public influence, um, um, you're just inviting now with a tax subsidy on top of it, a relatively unaccountable, non-transparent, powerful form of uh, uh, foundation activity in in a democratic society. And so um, what I think is possible is that uh, plutocrats can be domesticated to serve democratic purposes. So... That's the orientation I take to the question. 
Another way to approach this is just to say that large inequality is a standing feature of any political order. And in a democratic society, one task of democratic institutions is try is to try to make the wealthy elite um, serve democratic aspirations rather than subvert them. And um, I think that there are certain ways in which private foundations and philanthropy can in fact serve um, democratic purposes, and it's through the mechanisms you just alluded to earlier, namely a pluralism argument and a discovery argument. So uh, let me take those in order very briefly. Um, if philanthropy amounts to the creation of various forms of public benefits or social benefits through private means, um, it's a healthy thing in a de democratic society to partially decentralize the production of social benefits so that it's not only legislatures spending the money of taxpayers um, through ordinary democratic means that creates public goods or public benefits. Um, those are important mechanisms, but they shouldn't be the exclusive mechanism for the production of social benefits for a variety of reasons. It, most chiefly, in a democratic society where legislatures operate through uh, um, you know, majority vote, um, you'll have minority preferences permanently disenfranchised from their preferred social good production if they always have to assemble majority um, in order to get the expenditure of taxpayer dollars. So by partly decentralizing the production of social goods to philanthropists who are given the permission to have their idiosyncratic donor preferences um, manifested in what gets funded, um, then you know, minority groups or minority preferences will have a, a means to um, see some of their own preferred social good production. And when you aggregate that across all donor preferences, you get pluralism in civil society, and that is, in my view, a, a very healthy thing, possibly even a foundational constitutive element of a flourishing democratic order. So that's the pluralism argument. Um, the discovery argument uh, has to do with large foundations in particular, and here it again starts from the, um, the apparent vice of unaccountability uh, that foundations have. And what I try to do is find if there's a way to convert that vice into a certain type of virtue. So the, the vice is that there's no marketplace accountability for a foundation and there's no democratic or public accountability in the form of elections. No one can unelect Bill Gates or any other board of um, trustees from a foundation. And there's no marketplace competitors, as we said before. So in practice, what that means is that foundations have, if not the unique permission, at the very least an incentive structure that makes them distinctively able to pursue very long time horizon social experiments. Um, things that would take 10 years, 20 years or longer, where you would see the, the benefit of some um, you know, social investment or innovation. That time horizon is ordinarily not available in the for-profit marketplace for the ordinary short-termism -term of, of the stock market and an investor's patience. Similarly, not available in public agencies because of elections where people have to show, elected officials have to show typically some benefit to citizens um, within the cycle of election in order to be re-elected. And the short-termism that's present within the marketplace and in government is not present in, in foundations in virtue of their unaccountability. Um, they can take a long-time horizon view. So if foundations were to be one site in which there's experimentalism around social policy, that, where successful um, innovations are subject to social scientific testing, they're demonstrated to be useful in some important way or effective, and then presented, as it were, to a democratic public um, for scaling uh, up to the benefit of all citizens uh, or many citizens. That's a completely salutary mechanism for a democratic society. It's a way of ensuring that democracies are currently alive to new social conditions and experimenting so that social policy can adapt to changing conditions. And if we can partly decentralize that experimentation, um, that's a healthy thing for democratic order. And you gave a couple of examples of where private philanthropy brought about some really dramatically great things. 
Um, yeah, the classic example is the Carnegie Library System. Andrew Carnegie didn't say, hey, here's a great idea. I'd like to fund uh, libraries open to the public in perpetuity for any citizen or you know community that wants one. He pilot tested a whole bunch of them, partially funded them along with um, um, various you know cities. And then after citizens experience them, the Carnegie Foundation doesn't fund every single public library across the country now in perpetuity. It's now an ordinary public expense. It's been taken up in, uh, by taxpayers as an ordinary public good that, that uh, cities or states should fund. Um, and there's other similar examples of that particular kind. I can't help but note, however, that as we got much wealthier as a society and as unfortunately, I think, or maybe not, I don't know, but. We seem a little less interested in books, some of us. True. We still have libraries. <laughs> I'm we not sure do. there's a good case for a public library anymore. It's now really a place for people who have trouble getting internet access, which is a nice thing. It's not the worst thing in the world, but the book part of public libraries is uh, fallen apart, fallen down. Yeah. Uh, I want to come back to your point about pluralism because I thought that was really beautifully said and reminded me of a couple of things to get your reaction. One is it reminded me of make, how we make the case sometimes for – Capitalism over socialism. You don't want just a few kinds of cars. Uh, some people argue capitalism gives us too many choices. I'm not one of those people, but uh, it's really a remarkable thing that if you have a large family, there's a car for you. If you have, a, if you want to drive a sports car, there's a car for you. Uh, if you want gluten free bread, it's there for you. So there's lots of choice in in a free market society. And similarly, the foundations add to the choice that for socially beneficial activities. Uh, I think is and minority preferences is a really cool thing and, and and extremely important. It also reminded me of the fact that I think I heard this from Milton Friedman that in an author- authoritarian state, wealth is dangerous because it allows the funding of alternatives to the state. It allows the funding of threats to the state. So um, there's a certain um, – uh, protection from authoritarianism in the, in, in the form of wealth. I never thought I'd make that argument, and it's a little bit creepy. But um, uh, I, so I just think it's a it, it's a variation on your point. I think uh, if yeah. I understood it correctly, it's yeah. a, it's a little bit of a bulwark against tyranny. That's right. Uh, um, private wealth in that in that very narrow sense you just described can serve as a as a form of countervailing power to uh, um, a, a tyrant. And yet, you, know, you make that case, and it's beautifully made. And I think that I also love your point about innovation. At the same time, you recognize, and I would argue, this is a, a, a big concern for those of us like myself who think that philanthropy could have a much larger role uh, if government stepped out of the way. There'd be less crowding out of private charity. There'd be more giving if government did fewer things. One has to confront. I have to confront the reality that a lot of foundations don't seem to make that big a difference. Um, yeah, they don't seem right. to perform so well. And you raise that issue. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, so one of the consequences of the view I just described, and particularly this discovery argument, is that the role of foundations, perhaps against expectations now, is precisely not to try to fund ordinary social services, that is especially in the case where they were once provided by the state. So as the state... Um, um, has budgetary problems and seeks to offload some of the provision of public services to private means, in particular philanthropy, well, th- that's not social innovation or experimentation. That's just finding a, a different way to, to, to um, um, divert the cost of, uh, of a social service to a, 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 a some type of private, private means. And um, – um, what that means in practice for me is that foundations, if you have a, if you have a foundation and you're making a, a, a grant of money to the local soup kitchen uh, or, you know, to, uh, um, uh, I don't know, some, some type of, uh, in, you know, in my case, I get, I've written about the, the use of private money going to already wealthy public school systems, um, local education yep. foundations and the like, um, that's, uh, in my view, an example of the most regrettable kind of philanthropy because it's philanthropy in the service of exacerbating existing inequalities at the level of social services where the public has already assumed a responsibility for their provision, the public schoolhouse. And so what, what that's a case of is that uh, you know parents take a 
a tax deduction for the worsening of an inequality that the state, in my view, is already responsible for remedying. And in so doing, think that they're noble for having engaged in the activity, Um, a kind of psychological perversion on top of it all. Um, So when foundation money goes toward this um, genuinely long time horizon, risky undertakings of um, new social experimentation, that's a salutary thing, but not in the form of public public service provision of the kind that's familiar already. Um, charitable giving might be fine for that, you know, the $100 checks that you and I write, um, but we're not exercising huge power in doing that. But um, if you've got a foundation, um, you shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing that type of work. Let me, let me try out an analogy on you that I've, I've given on a couple of occasions. So when I give a talk to people who work in foundations, there's ordinarily, ordinarily some, some who are quite resistant to the criticisms I have to offer. Huh. And so I've, I, I, yeah, You're right. kidding. Stop it. Stop it. No. Um, I've tried sometimes beginning in a different direction. I'll say to people, I want to talk about the very eccentric um, organizational form of the private foundation, the, the legal codification and promotion of plutocratic voices in a democratic society. But before I get to that, um, let's talk about a, an organizational or institutional design that I, as a professor, enjoy that most people think is indefensible, and that's the existence of tenure, Yeah, which is job unaccountability for the rest of my working life. So, you know, short of breaking criminal laws or somehow abridging my contract, which requires me to teach a few classes, um, you know, nothing that I do with my research career could cause me to lose my job at this point. And again, I think the ordinary attitude that most people have is that that's a preposterous uh, institutional design to be unaccountable for your job performance for life. And what I often say to people is like, is that's basically the institutional design of an endowment. And in fact, the design is not for life, but for perpetuity. Um, No accountability for the performance of the endowment over the course of eternity and donor direction, just as I have, um, you know, a, um, um, intellectual uh, direction of, of my own uh, uh, my own research interests. So, what I ask people could be the defense of tenure, and there I think the answer might have something to do with free speech protections, but leave that aside for the moment. And it has something to do with the kind of long time horizon research uh, experiments that scholars uh, will take with the protection of tenure so that if I want to try learning two different languages, immerse myself in some other uh, you know, environment for a long time or study for 20 years to try to solve some mathematical proof or um, you know, become the world's expert on a single animal species and then you know, write up my work in a peer-reviewed way that con- uh, contributes to humanity's storehouse of knowledge, that's the kind of research activity that's not likely to be undertaken in the private marketplace or in public governments. A lot of it will amount to nothing. I'm, I'm not um, um, you know, uh, uh, wildly optimistic that all of the research activity of tenured professors is a truth tracking or a contribution to knowledge. And you know, let's say 75% of it amounts to nothing. But the 25% or pick a number of your choosing that does is uh, an important contribution. Now, here's the rub. If what I did as a tenured professor was to do small ball, modest incremental contributions to knowledge, a commentary on this paper, an additional little thing here and there, well, just put me on a five-year renewable contract and nothing about my output or anybody's output changes. Um, If tenure is a justifiable institution, then um, I've got to be engaged in risky, long-time horizon research projects, a lot of which will fail, but the design of of tenure for some people will prove to be quite socially useful. So that's the the analogy I draw to a foundation. If foundations are doing really tiny, risk-averse, you know, modest social um, contributions that aren't especially innovative, that aren't long-time horizon, then you don't need the institutional design of a foundation. Just make a donor advised fund and write some checks. Um, so uh, uh, tenure and uh, the form of private foundation are justifiable in light of their long time horizon experimental permissions. 
Yeah, and as somebody who's not a particularly big fan of tenure and who really likes the idea of a foundation, I have to. I'm in trouble either way. Um, I, I'd have to. I think I. When I look at the empirical evidence, I don't see a lot of evidence that tenure actually generates those long horizon projects. Uh, in fact, it 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 tends to induce the opposite. To get tenure, you have to do publish a lot of articles. Uh, and try to be uh, influential as quickly as possible. So right. certainly when you're pre-tenure, yeah. you, you tend to do very unambitious things. And now once you have it, now it's suddenly, oh, turn that switch off. <laughs> right. And it seems to me that a lot of academics uh, don't get out of that habit. But even I think the real – that's just a cheap shot at uh, – not a cheap shot, just a easy form of, of mm-hmm. lowbrow scientific observation. I think the much bigger problem – is that the people who go into academic life are not particularly risk taking? The idea that they would find this uh, post tenure environment uh, or envir- the life with tenure environment exhilarating for the freedom to do bold and brash things clashes with the uh, psychological makeup of most academics. Mm-hmm. There may be an exception or two or ten, even maybe. In which case, and it may be that those ten do enough of, that's worthy that it's uh, that it. Justifies Just the whole, as the whole thing, although it may also be the case that their passion would be uh, fulfilled no matter what. Uh, right. They would work in some garret uh, yeah. out of out of love for their subject at a pittance uh, without right. the need for tenure. And so to come back to foundations, and I, by the way, I love the analogy. I think it's very clever for getting them to open their mind to your, to your ideas. But I, I think similarly there's a problem with foundations that it, it can often attract people – who are not risk takers, who aren't entrepreneurs, they're, they're doing something else typically. Um, and, and I've talked about this before in the program. I think a lot of nonprofits uh, struggle with mission creep. Right. They start off passionate about the goals of the foundation and, and, and the power of innovation. But after a while, they tend to focus on just getting their budget larger. And I think the challenge for those of us who think that foundations could play a much larger role in civil society is to think about ways to innovate their performance. Someone who works on that, I think, in a very thoughtful way, I don't know if you've read his work, is Dan Pallada, who's been a guest on the program. Yep. Yep. And so I think we really need to try to revolutionize something of this world for it to have the impact it, it could have. Yeah, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm also, uh, like you, um, not optimistic about the actual performance or behavior of, of most foundations – especially as you drop out of the largest and most familiar. I mean, the vast majority of foundations are relatively modest inside, you know, a million dollars or less. And uh, those tend to be entities which are mainly ways of employing your children or your extended family um, to bring together your your relatives for intergenerational family value transmission um, and to have some, you know, enhanced social standing. I'm being a, a little bit skeptical or cynical there, but um, if you have a million dollar foundation which has a 5% annual payout rule where you're employing a bunch of relatives, um, the amount of money actually going out the door annually for social good production is pretty modest, and you could accomplish it just by writing charitable checks every year and forego the form of the foundation. And I think that would be socially better um, 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 than uh, the existence of foundations. Let's close with any observations you might have about what else we might do to improve performance in your view. So you just mentioned something we hadn't talked about before. Uh, I think all foundations have to spend at least five, what is it? Five percent of what? Yeah, five percent. Administration counts in that five percent, however. Administration of the foundation. They have to spend 5% of their endowment, the value of their endowment. So it, it allows for the possibility of growth because the, most of the endowment's presumably invested. So if – and of course some foundations are larger than when they started because right. they earn more than 5% and they only adhere to that 5% rule. Exactly. Um, and they, they tend to be very focused on keeping the the um, principle intact. They seek to exist in perpetuity. But we should mention there are foundations that do establish themselves with a write-down and a, and a death date to make right. sure there's no uh, drifting of donor, in, donor intent, right? That's right. The Gates Foundation is perhaps the most prominent. It, it, it has um, 
declared that it'll go out of existence. I think I have this right within 40 years of Bill and Melinda's death. Um, the Atlantic Philanthropies just closed shop, um, uh, sunsetting uh, one of the, the larger foundations that existed. And then, um, uh, is it the Olin Foundation yep. that did something similar? Yeah. So, so we do have, yeah, we do have some examples of foundations that sunset entirely. Um, sometimes because, as you say, um, donor intent is the, the, the chief thing and that, that, and that uh, even a, a relatively narrow board of governance um, of you know, um, chosen successors is not trusted to honor donor intent. Um, but also for the uh, ordinary and, to my mind, much more persuasive reason that uh, there are sufficient social problems worth working on today and future rich people can take care of unspecified future problems. And I think it also prevents what, what we might call calcification, which right. is the phenomenon I'm talking about where um, it just becomes a pleasant place to work rather than a way to save the world. Right. But, but going back to the policy issue, are there are any, is there anything that you particularly – think we ought to be doing differently in this area for to increase yeah. accountability? And if so, what, what might it be? Sure. And, well, and, so, and performance, not just accountability. Yeah. Um, okay. So start again with a kind of counterintuitive uh, point. Um, I think there should be a floor on the size of foundations, not a ceiling. Uh, I don't have a particular number, but let's just, you know, say 10 million or $25 million. If you don't have that much money, then just create a, a donor advised fund and make some, make some distributions from that. Um, in terms of performance and accountability, uh, I'd like to see more transparency in the reporting that's done about grant making. Uh, in particular, um, if your foundation is large enough to have a professional staff that's making evaluations of the grants out the door, and perhaps you even have a larger strategy that you're trying to deploy, so it's not just the effectiveness of any particular grantee that you're you're measuring, but you're measuring the effectiveness of your strategy as a whole. Well, now you're engaged in something like knowledge production yourself, and um, too many foundations house their their evaluations as you know kind of proprietary information. Uh, only occasionally to the benefit of the, of the grantee, and almost never to the benefit of the public. So I'd love to see foundations that made annual reports that shared their own organizational learning on the basis of what they've been trying to carry out. And then even more dramatically, I would love to see some experiments here. I'm, I'm taking advantage of the analogy to tenure. I'd love to see some experiments with peer review, um, not, a, you know, not, not a legal accountability structure that's demanded, but I'd love to see some large foundations experiment with various forms of peer evaluation of how the grant making strategies of their peers are, are going using, you know, various forms of ordinary social science to um, make that public. My guest today has been Rob Reich of Stanford University. Rob, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Real pleasure. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>